<laughs> well, hello everyone. Thank you for uh, navigating Soda Hall. Those of us who um, made it um, and coming out to tonight's laser talk. And thank you, Pierre, for having me speak about this subject, which is, as you know, very near and dear to my heart again tonight. My name, as Pierre mentioned, is Gary Voodoo. And I am an artificial experience designer who works on video games and other humane forms of software. And this is a story about a neural network that misunderstood everything I ever showed it. <laughs> so has everyone seen this sort of imagery before? Um, it's called Deep Dream, and interestingly enough, this particular image was the first of its kind. It was actually leaked from Google back in 2015, and I'd sort of forgotten about the so-called uh, leak at the time. But be as it, such as it is, it kind of opened the door to a, a floodgate of similar types of imagery, both from researchers and from enthusiast communities um, full of people like myself, who really had not done a lot of thinking about machine learning. And when I saw this image in particular, I, it just looked to me like a, it looked to me like a photograph of the collective unconsciousness. And I, I couldn't understand, I didn't, it blew my mind that a computer could see that so clearly. So, you know, what if you were to train a learning machine, a neural network, to recognize mundane subjects, but then show it science fiction? Mm. So, everything it's showing us is going to be wrong, because none of this was in its training set. However, there's levels of wrong. You know, and every now and then you'll see like a green answer. It's kind of a high confidence answer. And sure enough, space is a bit like velvet. And yeah, you know, it's true. The Enterprise D is something like an odometer and a CD player. The computer is merely wrong. But together, we, we can see the truth of it. Together, we made poetry. And that is what my work is all about. This is one of my early video experiments when I was first diving into this. And it shows an imaginary place that I call the cafe scene. And this cafe scene is just implicit in that particular data set that this neural network was trained on. It emerges in different forms um, at different times, but it's always in there. Here's a case where the computer has misunderstood so well that I can see it too. Well, where do these images come from? And so maybe before I get into that, I'm just going to speak briefly about machine learning and how it relates to um, image making, image synthesis. This is our basic artificial neuron. It's the basic building block of all neural computation. It's probably a lot simpler than a biological neuron. When you chain them together, you get a neural network. Each neuron depends on the previous one's output values to determine, do I fire, do I not fire? Machine learning is full of kind of aspirational terms. Uh, neural networks are networks of filters. 
And we could just as easily really call them filter networks, but I mean, you know, it's not the same. Convolutional neural networks are the type of neural network that we typically hear about when we read about things like image recognition, self-driving cars, um, image synthesis, audio <clears throat> processing. And what's unique about these is that they're three-dimensional structures. They are two-dimensional sheets with height and width of neurons that are stacked from end to end. And these particular blocks here, these stacks are called hidden layers. I used to kind of wonder, well, what does this term deep learning mean, and how does that relate to machine learning? It turns out that the deepness really is, well, how many of these hidden areas uh, do you actually have? And for something that is a common neural network, um, GoogleNet, um, is an open source neural network um, that's used, or some of the Google TensorFlow networks. Uh, they're so-called inception, like the movie, architecture. Um, they're gigantic. Um, they're much bigger than this. You may have something like 30 hidden layers in there. I'm kind of digressing on that, but um, I have information about neural networks and kind of like where do you find them, how do you get them in the wild, all of that's on my website. And I've got some um, postcards uh, back where my wife just walked in. And um, please feel free to grab them. Um, this really is just a visualization. This is just the same thing we were looking at before, but it's kind of show, it's showing the, the path of data through the network. So we have like our original image. Here's our input layer. Here's some filtering in our hidden layers. And what's kind of neat to look at is this network only knows one of two things at the end of the day. No matter what you show it, it's always going to be a cat or a dog. In the same way that when we looked at the Enterprise, well, it only knew CD players, odometers, and battleships, and so it was going to be one of those things. Um, by contrast, the neural networks, real-world neural networks, and particularly the ones that I use for image making, this output layer uh, may well contain a thousand possible entries, and those are called those are called classes. Those are how we identify our classifications. <clears throat> so these networks are actually quite big, and their behavior is nonlinear. So when we are trying to see, well, hey, what went wrong? Why is it not identifying what I thought it would? Um, for a couple of years now, a technique called inceptionism, again, like the movie, a dream within a dream within a dream, um, is a, a, that technique is used to pull out information from the network. And in this particular case, we're visualizing, uh, this network has been trained to understand a number of things. One of them includes basset hounds. Um, what we're doing instead, we're saying, we're saying, well, how does the machine understand basset hounds? What does that really look like? What does that filter look like? And instead of uh, passing an image through to be classified, um, what we actually do is we say, hey, we know what, the cl what class Basset Hound is. It just happens to be class number 161. What we want to do is to compute the optimal path through the network that will produce the result, Basset Hound. We're, it's pathfinding, quite literally. And then we take that signal that's generated, add it on top of, we start with noise, which I should have mentioned. We start with noise, and then we add it to the noise, and we send it back. We send it back through with the same intent. And as you can see, after maybe about a hundred iterations, a ghostly sort of basset dog appears, and that is a, called a class visualization. Here's another class, and this is something that my computer, my learning machine, knows about. Can anybody guess what this is a picture of? Mix between squirrel and a fox. Interesting. <laughs> um, that, that's actually really interesting. Um, I, I've thought that, oh, the ears. Um, it actually is a red fox. And um, what's kind of cool to notice about this is there's a bunch of kind of stuff. This is a low-res picture. There's a bunch of stuff like around here, but there's clearly foxy ears, snout, and maybe four pegs that are partial signifiers for 
fox nest. But this goes a little bit further than just the details of the subject. And um, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but this is actually the data set which was used um, to compute that <laughs> composite image of foxiness. Um, this is a tool called ImageNet. It's run by, um, uh, it's an open source endeavor. It's run at a team called Stanford. Anyone can use it. Um, and we can see here that this model, or this, we have 18,000 pictures of foxes for a computer to look at and to get in the habit of learning about foxes. Um, this one I find fascinating. Can anyone guess what this is a picture of? Saxophone player. Yeah. It is, in fact, the saxophone class. But it's interesting that, you know, you can clearly see something saxophony in there, but it's interesting that, well, it's kind of brought in hands. And more to the point, it's brought in a vague musician to play the saxophone. And this is presumably because in all of the training data, maybe it's a couple thousand pictures, this subject matter existed in that environment. And it's, you know, we don't really think about it like this, but yeah, saxophones, well, certainly, they can be pictured by themselves. Generally speaking, they're shown being held and being played. What I dig about this, though, is that there's a strange face that he has, and to me, it looks very soulful, it looks very beatific, it almost looks like someone. I can sort of tell what his haircut is like, and it appears to me that his suit is purple, although really, it's not exactly purple. It's, uh, I mean, why is it purple, you know? I mean, is it because, oh, musicians. Or is it because stage lighting was hitting it? All of these sorts of narratives, we don't know for sure, we have no idea, but all of these sorts of narratives actually came along like baggage, like unconscious, unclassified information with the primary classifier, uh, with the, pri with the uh, primary classifier, the saxophone. And so that is the essence of perception, storytelling, and poetry, in my opinion, quite frankly. And last one, can anyone guess what this is a picture of? It is. And that is the bear class. And you know, looking around, I mean, it's maybe a little, I'm not sure how the view is back there, but there are tree-like structures that have been brought in. Um, the, pear, the bear appears to be eating something on the ground, on the grass, um, a, a plant, I hope, something like that. Um, and there's small details of plants around here. So yes, yes, yes. So now this is your sort of ideal bear inside the neural network? This is the ideal bear. Is this what it's using to try to match against? That's exactly what it's doing. You can think so of this as a complex the filter. Is that the primaries and it's just using mm -hmm. that alone? That's a, there's a couple different bears in the data set, so it actually can distinguish between a couple of them. But yes, this is one of the bear filters the bear. that emerges. Yeah, and the ideal bear. I mean, you know. Uh, Aristotelian bear. I think so. It's, it's radical platonism, quite frankly. Um, sometimes, though, to generate the types of images that, you know, generating pictures of the classes is definitely cool, but they're always going to be the same. Once you've generated one, it's never going to look any different. When we want to go a bit deeper, and do something a bit more aggressive. We use a different visualization method, and this is called Deep Dream. And you know, in some ways it's a bit simpler. Instead of tracing like an optimal path through the network uh, for a classifier, what we actually do is we kind of throw up our hands. And we're like, well, I'm gonna throw, I'm gonna throw in an image. Any image will do, noise will work. Um, and I'm just gonna reach in to a certain piece, a certain layer of the network. And I'm going to listen to that, and I'm going to amplify the contributions of those layers and add them back to the picture, which will then go back through in a uh, feedback loop. So with each iteration, the picture becomes more and more uh, resolved. And here's another example, same picture, but at this point, I'm actually probing deeper into the network, into a part of the network that actually has um, a greater, uh, shall we say, understanding of not just geometry, but of shapes and forms. And there's a bunch of craziness that has happened at Stonehenge over there. Um, those cars turn into strange animals, and it's a 
it's an accumulation of things that network has learned about, but there's no context for it. Um, it's really just like poking at a memory and saying, meditate on that, free associate on that, hallucinate about that. So I took these concepts and I ran with them. <laughs> Everyone's seen Stanley Kubrick's The Shining here, I take it. It's an incredible movie. I mean, it's all about the architecture and the geometry of the movie. You know, and I wanted to... I wanted to enhance that and turn every pixel in this image into a haunted house, which is what this is. <laughs> just what you do with the audio track? You know, it's interesting you mentioned that. Um, I did a bunch of sound design to degrade the audio, um, resampled it, upsampled it a couple times because I needed it to sound neural. <laughs> as as well to sort of support the um, to support the imagery and you know I loved this imagery um, and I you know I will say several hundred hours later I kind of hit a dead end and you know I felt that something was missing deep dream and that type of visualization uh, it provides easy novelty but you know unless you have a personal relationship with the hallucinations that it's generating. It's just another video effect, right? And the algorithm itself that I'm running is deterministic. So given the same input, it'll always uh, you know, return the same output, which is great for video production, but wasn't quite the, it, it was difficult to, to communicate this kind of work in a way that other people could step into it the way that I stepped into it. And so, I couldn't change the algorithm. Instead, I showed it something unpredictable, and I showed it the world through a, web, a, a webcam. These are some of my initial rendering tests for my project, my video installation, Deep Dream Video Quest. And what's happened, that's our living room that's being transformed into strangely specific and yet vague architecture. And that's my hand waving in a mirror, and every time my machine detects motion, it reinterprets the scene and triggers another round of hallucinations. If there's no motion detected, it just keeps feeding back um, into itself. And Piero gave me that high sign, so I'm gonna actually hurry ahead to get to the great stuff. Um, here's like another example of that type of hallucination. Um, I'm lurking behind Lord Ganesha, and when I move, the hallucination uh, it's cycling. When I move, the hallucination uh, will re-trigger. Um, I started showing my work publicly. Um, this is an exhibition in San Francisco at the Kodame Art and Tech Festival. Um, I'd shown work previously at the Game Developers Conference in San Francisco. Um, this was better, though, because there was a DJ and there was also a bar. Uh, but you know, what I learned from that is that people were still at a distance from the machine and I wanted to bring them in closer. So this is an example of my current rig where I set up like an AV rig, took my 55-inch um, TV, my 60-inch TV, mounted it in portrait aspect and put a camera in the front and put a camera in the back. So it's both a mirror and a window. And I'm just kind of playing around in my living room. And because my wife is here, I'll kind of point out, like, there's our old media center and what we have now is so much better. Um, so glad we upgraded. Um, these are some scenes from uh, an event where I met Piero. This is at the last festival in San Jose. And these are, this is kind of like a best of reel, where I took like, some encounters that people had and just pre presented them in a continuous loop. Um, here's another person, and kind of rushing. I, I always like to use to kind of talk about Deep Dream Video Quest as a video game, but really I was just sort of joking. Um, it turns out that from this event, there were a number of players, especially like a little kid who I don't show here, who actually kind of won the game. Um, get a step forward. This is an empty room. So what's next? Seeking collaboration, seeking new um, avenues for um, exhibition, 
seeking sponsorship, and further R&D. Um, as I mentioned, I have some postcards in the back of the room, and my contact and my particulars are back there, and I hope you will, uh, I hope you will take a look. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, I hope you enjoyed the talk. Um, my name is Gary Boudou, and this is my dream. Thank you very much.